Welcome to this wonderful evening, an evening in which we're just going to exchange ideas. So I've already introduced myself, I'm Carol Much, so I'm the Education Commissioner for the New Zealand National Commission for UNESCO, and there are some people I'd like to acknowledge before I go much further. Uh, we have in the audience Robin Baker, who is the Chair of the National Commission. Sadly, we don't have uh, Vicky Soans, our Secretary General. She's not feeling well tonight. I'd like to thank the National Library staff for allowing us to use their premises. We did this last year and we found it was such a um, convenient and a place with a nice ambiance that we wanted to come back again. So thank you for helping us out tonight. Thank you to the um, Secretariat of UNESCO for the organisation that you do behind the scenes. And we will have a brief message later from the Honourable Jenny Celesa, Associate Minister of Education, who is also responsible for the National Commission for UNESCO. But I've got a few opening remarks before then. Oh, I forgot to say, welcome to you. Thank you. It's Friday night in Wellington. You could have been in any number of places, and here you are. And we were just having a little chat before saying, one of the nice things about UNESCO events is that they don't belong to one generation or one group of people. They draw people from a whole range of diverse interests. So welcome to all of you and to everyone there who's watching us streaming live on Facebook. Actually, I think that might be my first time I've ever streamed live on Facebook, so I'll put on my best smile. Now, you're wondering, for those of you who are not familiar with UNESCO, what does the National Commission in New Zealand do? Well, of course, those of you, if I was giving you a quiz, which in my real life as a university lecturer I might do, um, you'd be able to tell me that it's a United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organisation. But what do we do in New Zealand? Well, we still have to uphold UNESCO's worldwide mandate, but we can't do everything. So we pick specific topics or projects that we think are more relevant to us here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And whichever ones we pick, we try to find ways in which we listen to expert voices, listen to ordinary voices, bring people together, share our knowledge, because the, the overall mandate is that we're here as in our little local world trying to solve massive global problems, whether they be um, poverty, whether they be educational inequality, whether they be um, climate change and so on. If we all come together from our diverse perspectives, then maybe we'll be able to find an answer to some of these. And the particular project that you have come to find out a little bit more about tonight is global citizenship education. Now, I've got lots of lovely notes, and I could read out the formal definition of global citizenship education, and I will do in a moment. But first, I want to tell you a story, because I always think that you won't remember the fancy bits I read out, but you will remember the stories. And this story is a bit emotional for me. Whew. Let's see if I can get through it. My son is a journalist. He's currently in a, a region in the world. Uh, well, he's in a little town, well, a, a very small st city called Stepanakort. And that is, of course, in Nagorno-Karabakh. So if you don't know where that is, there's Armenia and there's Azerbaijan, and there's a little enclave that they're fighting over. And he's right in the town that's right in the middle of that enclave. And not last night, but the night before, I was woken up in the middle of the night to be told by him that he was fine. Now, you know what that means? That something terrible has just happened and he survived it. And that's exactly what happened. Um, he, he was out with the, in the press van and they were shelled. And so he did survive and came back to the hotel. And, you know, we kind of, this is one, two, three o'clock in the morning. We, we debriefed. But then last night, this is the interesting part of the story that's got something to do with global citizenship education. I got another phone call. Well, my heart leapt out of my body and I thought, oh, no, 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 not more bombs, please. 
But no, it was Rosa. Now, Rosa was translating for her mother. And she was telling me, I mean, she had no idea, of course, it was the middle of the night in New Zealand because it was the middle of the day um, in Stepanakert. And what they wanted to say was they had met my son, Nick, and they, and they wanted to say, thank you. Oh, thank you for being such a good mother because you sent your son to the other side of the world to care about us to care about the hospitals being bombed, to be, care about the children who couldn't go to school, to care about the people who, with terrible COVID-19 symptoms, are crowded into hand-dug-out um, bomb shelters. You cared about us. So that was, you know, loosely the translation of Rosa's mother talking to Rosa and Rosa talking to me. And I went, you know... That's global citizenship education. That's our role as teachers, as educators, as parents, as community people to, to help whoever, whether it's our children, it's our young people, the people in our communities, see us as part of a much larger global ecosystem where we can't all be journalists who go into war zones but we can do something locally that could just be the pebble in the water that makes a huge difference nationally and internationally. So that's my story. And here's the formal definition so I can catch my breath. Global citizenship education places value on our interconnectedness as human beings beyond geographical borders and sees the issues we each experience wherever we are as collective. Human rights, inequality and poverty. These threaten our very existence, our peace, our sustainability. These are global issues, not just local issues. And so global citizenship education encourages all of us, but especially being mindful of our children and our young people, to act responsibly, to think thoughtfully, and to look around at our immediate communities and think of how we can be promoters of peace, inclusivity, and sustainability globally. Oh, I got through that. However, you didn't come to hear me, though I've had my five minutes of fame now. You came to hear our amazing panel. And the people that we have tonight have come from diverse walks of life. So we have students, we have an entrepreneur, and we have an academic. And so hopefully one of these or all of these will touch you in some way. So we have Josh and Fred from St John's College in Cambridge, and they're going to tell us about some of the innovative programs that they've been involved in. And we have Sharithi from Emerge Institute, and she will tell you, I've seen her CV. Wow, some people do more in, in their young lives than I've probably managed to achieve in my not-so-young life. And she'll be telling us some, about some of the amazing things that she has done as well. And my colleague, uh, Peter O'Connor, is going to talk about one particular project that he's been involved in. And so he can give you all the facts and figures of how many people downloaded this amazing program that he put together so without much more ado from me, I'm going to ask our wonderful IT people to make the Minister, via the wonders of modern technology, share some remarks with us. Kia ora koutou katoa and greetings everyone. May I first of all offer my humble apologies for not being able to be with you in person today. I'm really delighted, though, to be able to send you this message in my capacity as Associate Minister of Education with responsibility for National Commission for UNESCO, as well as an enthusiast of global citizenship education. This is my third opportunity to support the National Commission in Global Citizenship Education. Last year, the Commission presented five fascinating papers on global citizenship education in the New Zealand context, and it's wonderful to have the opportunity to once again acknowledge that work and to see some practical projects being undertaken right around the country. The projects and ideas being shared tonight make a compelling case for collaboration between different people, cultures and backgrounds. Our speakers tonight have much to share and to inspire us with. This past year has been extremely tough 
for all of us here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, as well as right around the world. However, facing the challenges thrown up by COVID-19 pandemic also provides the perfect environment to apply the values of global citizenship education with understanding the need for interconnectedness at a local and global level being of crucial importance. In fact, there's never been a time in our recent history where our connection to one another, our communication with one another and our actions having had such a rippling global impact. One of our younger presenters tonight worked with his school peers on an invention during lockdown to create a safe, effective and cheap ventilator at a time when there were global concerns that this vital piece of equipment was in too short a supply to meet the pandemic demands. This kind of thinking demonstrates the essence of global citizenship education's principles, that acting on local issues and finding solutions to those can also be relevant to global problems. Global citizenship education is a strategic priority area for UNESCO and is defined as empowering learners of all ages to take up active roles both locally and globally to build more peaceful, tolerant and interactive societies. With a focus on cognitive, socio-emotional and behavioural learning, it fosters skills to better understand the world and its complexity through thinking, knowledge and communication that allows people to live alongside one another respectfully and peacefully. This is very important work and I'm pleased that the New Zealand National Commission for UNESCO continues to actively promote, support and to connect people through with events such as tonight's. I wish you all well for the presentations, new ideas, and the conversations following up from tonight's events. Malo ao pito, tēnā koutou katoa. So, Malo, um, to our minister, to thank her very much for taking the time to put that presentation together. Uh, just to, before I invite the the, the first two speakers up, and yes, I've been told, why did I say Cambridge? There is a St John's in Cambridge, but you're St John's Hastings, so my apologies. Um, just to remind you that how we will go from here is we will have our speakers, the, 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 the two young men will speak together and the other two speakers will speak individually. Then they will come back as a panel. I'll throw them a question or two just to warm them up, and then we will open it up to you, and we have some of our lovely staff who'll bring microphones around. So that will give you a chance to ask them uh, specific questions about their projects or generic questions about big ideas, if, if that's what you wish to do. So, without further ado, let's sh change all my pieces of paper. Oh, I think I've got the order wrong. And we have uh, Josh Villanueva, I have it correct, great, thank you, who is a Year 13 student at St John's College, Hastings. Um, and, wow, again, another one of those amazing CVs. So I'll just pick a few little highlights. So he's in his final year, and he was appointed college captain at the beginning of this year. He's also on the College Board of Trustees. He's a young Vinny. For those of you who are Catholics or those of you who, who go to charity shops, you'll know the Vinnies very well. Um, but he's involved in a, a program called Whatever It Takes. And his particular interest is in mental health, especially for the most vulnerable in the community. And we also have Fred Devereaux. He is also a Year 13 student at St, College, at St. John's College Hastings, also in uh, Young Vinnies, and also in Whatever It Takes. But you've already had a sneak preview from the minister about um, the particular project that he's going to talk about. He also has an amazing CV. And um, I see he's also working on yet another project about uh, robotic and engineering and so on. So you might want to ask him about that when he's finished. And if you don't know uh, St John's College, then it's uh, a Catholic boys' secondary school in the Hawke's Bay region. Uh, it's a low decile school with a roll of 390 and a very divergent uh, student population, but they have a great focus on social enterprise and particular project work. 
so perfect for finding out about how global citizenship education plays out in the community. So big round of applause for our two. Good evening, everyone. My name is Fred Devereaux, and I'm here with Josh Villanueva on behalf of our school, St. John's College Hastings. I'm a Year 13 Prefect at St. John's, and I'd like to show my gratitude and appreciation for the privilege we have of being here tonight on this lovely city on behalf of our school. It's a huge honour to be here and have this opportunity at our age, so for that we're very thankful. Now getting started. At St. John's, we engage in both social enterprise and special projects both of which have shared features and characteristics. They reflect the special values of St. John's College. There is no limitation of entry to each program by students. All work is completed in students' own time, so there is no academic interference. And all cash flows released from the projects through awards are not retained by students, but are rather invested back into our community. Now I'll start talking about our, so our journey with social enterprise through all the way back in 2017 with a unique partnership between our students and the youth within the Hawke's Bay prison, creating a company named Brothers. This group was a huge success, with it being a company we believe to reflect the values of St. John's. They were able to secure a partnership with Icebreaker New Zealand and had an, a fantastic year of sales, with one of the team members being named the National Chartered Accountant CEO of the year. In 2018, we had a group named George, who was in partnership with Ravensdown and Whatever It Takes. George was a low-cost rain and water level detector, which worked in real time, providing, ex providing data to the cell phones of farmers or property owners, with the driver of this venture being the extreme weather conditions that farmers face in New Zealand. Ravensdown came on board saying they loved the idea and they thought it was a very useful and cost-effective tool. We also found that this dem demographic suffered from a lot of mental health issues, which is why we also partnered with Whatever It Takes, which Josh will touch on later. For George, we received national publicity from TVNZ, Māori TV and the New Zealand Herald. 2019 was the year we had the group named CARE. In this group, we had our students complete the development of a solar-powered medical steriliser with the intention to be deployed to island nations across the Pacific where power supply is not assured. The Unity Care Mark I was a cheaper and more robust thing, uh, robust than anything in the international market. Also in 2019 and continuing into 2020, we have the Environcrete Group, which works on the development of environmentally friendly and cost-effective building material for the purpose of reducing their everyday civilians' carbon footprint with recycled products. Currently, the group are in negotiations with the Napier City Council for production and placement of a styled version of product, and we have an agreement with the Hastings District Council for stylized seating units. And finally, in 2020, we have two new groups, one being Te Tui Tui Mātauranga, which works on a techno technologically embedded product to work in conjunction with our partners in plant and food. The exact nature of the product is still confidential, while the team assesses their intellectual property rights, but the, but the company is still making incredible progress. And the other 2020 group and my social enterprise group, Project Peer, in which me and six others have now finished the construction uh, of solar-powered sustainable streetlights for communities. This aims to keep uh, both communities and workers safe, while providing assistance to farmers through lighting. We as a group have partnered with firms to support our development, such as CL Automation, Free Energy, and Home and Engineering. During the coronavirus pandemic, Project Peer also created an industrial grade ventilator, which now resides in the National Museum of Te Transport and Technology in Auckland. The, venti the ventilator gained national attention from Radio NZ, Stuff, NZ Herald, and the New Zealand Education Gazette. Social enterprise work at St. John's embraces critical thinking, adaptation, debate, action, and responsibility. We are always striving as a community to set the bar high for other schools to, so they can reach their fullest potential. I'd now like to move on to special projects at St. John's, which will be spoken on by Josh. Good evening. Just to introduce myself again, my name is Josh Villanueva, and I'm the head boy for St. John's this year. It's been already said, but I'd just like to show my own personal appreciation for the opportunity to speak. 
Talking about special projects, I'd like to start with our National Poverty Index. In 2017, our students presented our first National Poverty Index, characterized by simplicity, but with a strong resonance to our St. John's community. There are several components of our index that represent our considered approach as to the measures of poverty in our community and our wider New Zealand society. First, we have endeavored to make the index non-political in nature insofar as students are independent for any prevailing agendas. Next, solutions are not offered, nor is causation as to the drivers of the, of the specifically identified levels of poverty. What is provided by this robust index is a clear insight into the currently widening poverty gap within New Zealand and its effect on our both local and national community. This index is our collective effort to label the issue of poverty using an evidence-based approach. With this, we can hope it can be the basis of good quality discussion, both locally and nationally, with the end game of ensuring poverty levels are reduced. The calculation is based on three pillars, housing affordability, child poverty, and national prison muster numbers. And our results can be seen on screen. The next initiative we have is Policy Lighthouse. This initiative is two years old, which comprises of year 10 and 11 students. These students would regularly make submissions to the select committee on bills they have interest on as youth from the province. Students seek the establishment of a permanent drug court within Hawke's Bay region. It will make both the community stronger and safer and provide a positive and proactive approach for those who are convicted. Students making up the lighthouse are employing the best evidence and reason to pursue their goal. There is a very clear emphasis on acting in a non-political manner with a focus on the issue. This advocacy is a theme within the college community, having been engaged for the past four years working alongside the Hawke's Bay Prison Youth, street advocacy, and establishing a long-term relationship with whatever it takes trust, WIT, who works alongside the addicted and homeless. As a collective of students, proactive advocacy has been pursued, sharing their story about the need for change and building strong community network within the decision makers who share their goal for positive difference through establishing a drug court and where we have had recent success as now a drug court is being considered to be inducted in the Hawke's Bay region. The journey thus far has been difficult for the students Many barriers and obstacles have been encountered and overcome, but there is a richness which can be expressed by each student's participation. And such work is un undertaken within a Catholic secondary, secondary school environment with clear value. Community-based work that students can know that make a real difference in lives of those on the margins of society. The story offered of that students from the province of Hawke's Bay who have been working away quietly and in a dignified manner on a sustainable project in their own time with the goal of assisting their community to becoming stronger and safer. The Hawke's Bay has a significant problem of drug addiction, crime, gang membership, and domestic violence, with students all having their own story to tell. Within a, although within a college community that supports them and nourishes them and has an evidence-based approach to change. As we saw accentuated during the lockdown, Education is now likely to be supported by digital technology. But based on our work and experience at St. John's College, it is not appropriate for learning to be delivered by this means alone. We believe our social enterprise and project work have met this need. As Brazilian educator Paulo Freire observed many years ago, learning is an active process and not simply a matter of banking information in a passive recipient mind. Teaching needs to be, to be transactional or a transformational process, rather than just a transmission of information. The transactional aspect is essential to enabling students to challenge their situation in life, where they must learn to do if they are to play their parts in, as active citizens in a better world. Teaching must be approached in a disruptive way, if to instill inquiry skills in learners and encourage them to think for themselves. Rather than mindlessly accept, we believe our social enterprise project and special projects have met this need. We are delighted with the opportunity to share our work this evening for our friends back at St. John's and those students who have preceded us. New technologies are always being developed, global responses discussed and talked about to various problems in the modern age. 
We need a good model of education that works and is embedded in our communities, models that can inform both national and global approaches. We must, ta we must take this idea and spread it far and wide. Thank you for having us and have a brilliant night. Wow. If, I mean, what are you, I'm speechless. Are you speechless? Here we have two amazing young men, only two of the many amazing young people that we have in New Zealand. So thank you so much. You've exemplified for us why we need to hear your voices. I, mean, I could see Peter in the, in the front there going, wow, they're talking about Paulo Freire. These are young people who know about Paulo Freire. He's so excited. I'm sure he'll tell you more about Paulo Freire later. But, wow, yes, thank you. And I just want to pick on one word. The word that resonated with me was dignified. And you absolutely exemplified that. You, you do this in your own time. Um, on top of your studies, and you do it in a quiet way so that many people around New Zealand will never have heard of you. And it's through that dignity and authenticity that we need young people like you because you will help us solve these really crucial problems that, um, I'm sorry, my generation and the generation of some of you out there have kind of left you with. So, wow, amazing round of applause for, for them again. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, can we top that? Well, it's not that we're trying to top that, but it's just that it's such an exciting night because we're now moving on to um, a slightly older, a little bit more experienced uh, social entrepreneur, who, but again with a CV that would um, sort of blow mine out of the water. So Shruti um, has, has been working in, in Boston where she was interested in getting business people to think about the environment and uh, how that interacted with people's lives. And one of the big things that she learned was that um, it's about changing mindsets. And she went on to work in India with a, a group called Better World and focused on teaching empathy, creativity and global issues in classrooms. And then she came back to New Zealand and uh, trained as a coach and ran a social entrepreneur business. Then she went off to Oxford and got herself um, an MBA and did amazingly well by reading her CV. Wow. I think I'll stop there because she could probably tell us a lot more about what she has done. But yet again, another amazing young person. So welcome to the stage, Ruthie. Um, kia ora koutou. Thank you so much for having me. Um, ko Shruti toku ingua. It's my real pleasure to be here. And really, I'm so grateful to be here. Even just to step on the flight from Auckland, I was like, wow, we can be on flights and gather in person, which is such a privilege given the global situation. So really a joy to be here in person. Really want to acknowledge the folks at UNESCO and everyone else who's made this event possible. Love your kaupapa and really happy to support and look forward to much more inspiration, conversation and connection. So, so thank you. Um, so the, the project I want to share a bit more about today is with a little venture that myself and three colleagues are running up in Auckland called Emerge Institute. And this really builds on our collective experience seeing, of being in the sort of social entrepreneurship world, seeing many change makers like these two young men kind of go after issues they care about. And we noticed a couple of gaps or issues when it came to trying to make an impact and address the issues that our world so desperately needs addressing. One issue we found was just the lack of self-awareness. So often we're so focused on what we do and how to have impact that we don't often question, why am I doing this? Or where is it really coming from? You know, many of us have guilt and pressure, overwhelm, anxiety, all of these emotions, a lot of stress, and that's often forgotten and leads to all sorts of burnout and issues and relationships in ourselves and our mental health, mental health crisis, as you spoke about, Josh. And often this piece of connection is also lost. You know, I love the, the definition of global citizenship education that emphasized interconnectedness. And we find, particularly with environmental entrepreneurs, we're often sitting behind a computer trying to solve the climate crisis. We're sitting in rooms like this, disconnected from the very planet, the water, the ocean, the earth that sustains us, that's a part of us, our mother earth, a papatuanuku, and that she's not part of the conversation 
the sort of spiritual disconnect from each other, from the land and from ourselves and our source of what drives us leads to us perhaps not being as effective as we could. And so we formed Emerge really as a way to help change makers, young or old, you know, you could be 16, you could be 70, we've had the full spectrum come on our courses and really give them the tools to manage themselves, to gain more self-awareness and reconnect so that their work can really serve the communities and have the impact it wants to have. So I'm gonna pause there and play you a short video. It's from our first uh, project. It was an oceans lab looking at how we restore the health and the life force of Tikapa Moana, the Hauraki Gulf up in Auckland. It will give you a flavor of what our work looks like and then we can share more together. We're alive at a time that we need to take action and shift things, but to shift the world, we need to shift ourselves. Fundamentally, we need to operate from a place where we're calm and connected and relaxed. And if that's there, we think the kind of action that we'll produce is going to be far more effective. So the Oceans Lab was all around how do we restore the health of Te Kaka Moana. And we went through a range of processes and workshops, connecting to ourselves and our relationship with Moana. and then coming up with projects to work on um, how do we restore the health and the life force. You are in this mode of working towards a project when really we are the project. I can definitely see the behavioural change in myself already. So there's been a few times, especially the last couple of days, where I've caught myself changing my own behaviour. And that's been a really lush feeling to actually go, hey, look, this is making a change. The way that the space was held and the way that the program was put together and facilitated really made me feel really safe to be vulnerable. With this group of people who we didn't know a few days ago, how we've just become, you know, shared really deeply and intimately with each other and <laughs> it's been amazing. We have such hope from these 21 people and the way they showed up and the ripple effect that, that would have in the communities they work in, on the Gulf, on Auckland City, on Aotearoa, and then in the world. Awesome. And yeah, big acknowledgement to our many friends and sponsors that made that possible. So this project was bringing 21 environmental innovators. There were folks from council, small business, big business, students, kind of retired folks, really members of the community that came together to explore what is meaningful action for oceans restoration look like. So I wanted to share a couple of stories of people that came on the Gulf to give you a sense of the journey they've been on and the impact this has had. So Adam, um, who was one of the people you saw in that video, he runs Waiheke Dive and Snorkel. So he's a small business owner, like many people in Waiheke, cares deeply about the Hauraki Gulf, the ocean kind of that the island rests on. And his business is a vehicle to kind of do conservation education. Not only that, you know, he's involved, uh, he was at the time involved with several local uh, non-profits sitting on their boards, the Waiheke Marine Collective, an organisation kind of doing grassroots community action. And he came into this programme really tired, like really exhausted, really overwhelmed, like many change makers I've seen, like myself at points in my life, you know, really like trying to make an impact and grabbing every opportunity he could, but feeling like it just wasn't going anywhere, feeling exhausted, feeling guilty for not giving his best effort, seeing his personal relationships really suffer. And he came on this lab and we really spent kind of initially five days on the island, followed by many workshops and coaching sessions to explore kind of what was going on for Adam and where was he coming from? And he realized actually, what he needs to do is say no to a whole lot of things. It's kind of funny because he came onto this program and <laughs> quit many of the organisations through which he was actually addressing the Gulf's issues. But what he found was as he said no to the things that he was just grabbing on for the sake of trying to have an impact, he was able to slow down and breathe out, take care of his well-being. He started doing yoga, treating his body better, had some brave conversations and personal relationships to get them in place. 
and started running his business in a different way, rather than this sort of rushed pressure, go, 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 faster, better, more culture that we live in, particularly in the cities. You know, living in Auckland, everyone's rushing somewhere, going somewhere. We feel kind of somehow validated by our busy schedules. I heard this notion recently called internalized capitalism, when I measure my self-worth based on how much I do and how many people I know and how many things, you know, I can put to my name. And he sort of began to shine the light on that, not judging that as wrong, but just brought his awareness to that and decided I want to focus on doing one or two things really well and slow down and bring more presence and groundedness to what I do. So with his business, it's been a crazy journey. When he first came on, he found the business was really growing rapidly. And he found as it was growing so quickly, there was a risk that the purpose would be lost. If we're going to serve more and more tourists and give them snorkeling adventures, there's a risk that will hurt the oceans in the process, that we'll have more people in there polluting the oceans, that we don't have space to talk about conservation. And he's like, I don't want to just you know, follow this game that everyone's playing. So through this journey, he's been able to really create space in his company to focus on well-being, to focus on what really matters, to kind of clear out a lot of the noise and go, why are we here and how do we have the impact we want to have? And what blew my mind a few days ago, I was speaking to Adam and he said, in the last three months, like tourism businesses have struggled through COVID, right? We've got, we're not getting any tourists here, hardly any. And his business has had the same revenue for the last three months as last year. And I said, Adam, how is that even possible? Like, how can you do that? And he said, it's because we spend more time connecting with our clients. We build relationship. We focus on our well-being. We have more space for creative ideas. We're seeing new possibility. We're working with council to get students in the Gulf. We're helping citizenship science. We're having more impact. And I'm, I'm more resourced. I'm not so tired. And my relationship at home is better. And I was so touched to see this kind of ethos in action. And I think to give Adam real credit, like there's the tools and there's the processes, but it really takes bravery and someone to go, I want to apply this, which Adam has been able to do. Another sort of aspect of this eMERGE process is really bringing Mother Nature into our process of change. So another wahine, a beautiful woman from Auckland Council, her name is Danny. She was in our Oceans Lab and her job is awesome. She trains high school leaders to be climate environmental advocates and, and supports them in their kind of leadership journey. And she realized the whole environmental services team at council doesn't really bring the earth into the conversation. We talk about the environment as if she's separate from us. And I think it's how I've been educated as well, you know? Like, even if, if you say Mother Earth, and when you talk about, you know, the earth having a life force or a spirit, the first time I heard this, I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. Like, what do you mean? Like, we scientifically observe the earth with our minds, but the reality is we're in deep connection with her. The indigenous Māori here, I think, know that and live that through their notions of Papa Tuanuku. I've discovered even my people in India, we call her Bumata. You know, Mother Earth is a concept in many traditions. And if we really explore this notion of the environment and how we relate to it, the reality is our existence is dependent on it. You know, the air I breathe, you know, the water I drink, the food I eat, like I am nature in a very practical, you know, physical sense. And so if I'm not connected to her, how can I really... How can I really serve her and work with her to restore the health? I think often we find in kind of making change, we have this very ego human centric approach where humans are superior to nature and nature exists for us, our exploitation and to serve us. And our approach with Emerge is sort of humbling us to realize, you know, we're children of the earth. I exist because of mother earth. And therefore from that place of reverence and gratitude and connection, how can I serve her? And as people embody this mindset, it's a subtle shift. It's not a tangible technology. It's a subtle shift in mindset. The way teams work and the way solutions come about are profoundly different. An example, so Adam previously, the sort of, you know, when he had the pressure to grow his business, all the other dive companies were saying, yeah, yeah, take on more customers. You can make much more money. And he said, no, if I take on more customers, it's going to hurt the earth. It's going to hurt our community. So actually, our approach should be to maybe take less profit, but invest more deeply in connection and education. The kinds of solutions aren't so much about being more effective and more efficient, so we can you know, run our cars on less fuel or run our lights for longer, but maybe consuming less resources to begin with, because I'm aware that if I consume less, actually the earth is better off, there's more for others, and what's good for me is good for the whole. It's this idea of interconnectedness. And I think a metaphor that sums up the sort of shift that we're trying to create with Emerge is the human body. I think the human body is amazing. I'm no biologist, but it's just a remarkable piece of science. Every organ functions to such perfection, you know? The lungs, the heart, everything plays its part in such harmony. 
in such unity. And you think, you know, even in the instance that my tongue, my teeth might bite my tongue, my tongue doesn't get angry at my teeth and go, why did you bite me? You know, we forgive and we accept and we, we acknowledge we're all part of this one living system. If I get a cut, it's amazing how quickly my cells can reorganize and like heal it. Like we saw the Auckland Harbour Bridge, you know, like fall apart and it's taken us months to try and get that in order. But the human body with such efficiency and such, you know, it really revolves around this greater purpose and everyone plays their part. So I guess what we're trying to say is what would it look like for us to be like the human body? What would it look like for each of us to play our part to perfection without trying to prove, without trying to get validation, without trying to, you know, nothing is guilty. Nothing feels like I'm not doing enough today. I need to do more. I'm not busy enough. There's none of that going on. Everything is takes such comfort in its authentic place. Nothing is more or less important. It's not about climbing a ladder and being higher or worse. But if we can really tune into our inner wisdom, if we can slow down, really be in that relaxed place, our sort of belief is we can find our unique part. And for Adam, it was saying no to a whole bunch of things. You know, for Danny, it was really reconnecting with the earth and creating space in her team to see how she could train her environmental leaders. And the kind of yeah, solutions we create as a system are going to be far more effective if we can really embody that level of unity and that level of connectedness, which is a nice word to throw around. But what does it really mean to feel and to acknowledge that your actions affect me and my actions affect you? So that's really the essence um, of the Emerge Method, a belief in our deep interconnectedness, a focus on self-awareness, not just what we do or how we do, but why I do it, and supporting entrepreneurs and change makers, young or old, in their global citizenship learning journey to really learn how to come from that place of fullness, of wholeness, of groundedness. It's where practices like meditation, journaling, being in nature, you name it, there are so many ways in which we can plug into that place but the belief is if we can operate from that place, the solutions we create will be truly systemic and support the flourishing future that we all dream of. So all the very best and thank you for having me. Well, I, th I felt like I was watching a TED talk. <laughs> What, what, what an accomplished speaker you are, as well as the words, you, you, have, you have such a way. So I took away two messages from that. One was internalised capitalism. Whoa, OK, I'm taking that one back to work. I'm going to talk to a few people about my internalised capitalism and theirs and maybe think, not only did you present so well, but actually you made us all think about ourselves and slowing down and reconnecting and thinking about Papatuanuku, thinking about nature and so on. So that was so important because the other thing I was really struck with in your talk was we are the project. Someone said that on, um, uh, on your little video and I thought, yes, we are the project. We can bring up wonderful speakers who inspire us, but actually all of us, we are the project. And uh, Gracie Alley just uh, came and scrawled a little note to say that um, Danny, that you mentioned, it actually was one of our UNESCO youth leaders. So there we are. It's that interconnected world again, isn't it? So that um, uh, she's connected to you, she's connected to us, and we are all connected together. Okay, Peter, you've got to top this. Do you think you can? Um, we'll have to see. So... I could talk about Peter and his shoes and all sorts of other things, but I'll stick to my notes. But actually, he d one of the things that we do know about Peter, he has the most amazing shoes. He doesn't have his green ones on today. He has his fancy Portuguese ones. But, um, yeah, we all have our little ways, don't we? So what is, I, I better read the CV rather than go off, off, uh, off script too much. So Peter is a world leader in applied theatre research focusing on the role and place of the arts for social transformation. And as with our other speakers, truly he does have, I'm, I'm off script now, he does have this most amazing CV. So he's worked in prisons and refugee centres and homeless centres and disaster zones. In fact, um, uh, we connected when we worked in uh, post uh, disaster Christchurch, post earthquake Christchurch, post bushfires in the in Australia, and doing some work recently around COVID nineteen, which is what he's going to talk about. So, 
we go from young people full of energy to, uh, and I've no idea your age, but you still look young to me, so a, a slightly older young person full of energy, to an even older person full of energy. So Peter O'Connor from the University of Auckland, hands together. Um, I wanted to suggest, um, having spent some time talking about being in body, um, that um, the longer you sit, the less you learn. Did you want to have a stretch? Yes. Oh, my God. Yes. Yes. And how about saying something for the first time? Maybe if you know them really well, give them a hug. Oh. Yeah, we're allowed to do it. Oh, I'm all these hours up. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, um, take a seat, don't rush, you know, we've been told to do things nice and nice and easily in life now. Um, it's a real delight to listen to this extraordinary group of uh, younger people um, committed to making a difference in the world. Um, makes you feel good on a Friday night, I, you know, usually by a Friday this yeah, I'm well and truly into the first whiskey by now. So it's kind of like you know, um, it's a it's a real delight to to be to have young people talk about Paulo Freire, a Brazilian educator who understood that the purpose of education is not personal achievement, not individual achievement, but the idea of making humans more fully human, and that part of making yourself more fully human is a capacity to provide that same opportunity to others. And to be reminded of that by you two fine young men today made this old professor feel particularly proud to be alive. So thank you so much for that. Um, in January of this year, I got a phone call from a colleague and friend of mine in Australia. And um, Carol's uh, uh, a researcher in disasters. I'm just a disaster as a researcher. But um, <laughs> she rang me and she said, Peter, I don't know if you know, Australia's on fire. And I did know for a number of reasons from the news, but it was also at a time when the smoke and the ashes were darkening our skies here as well. And they, um, because of the work that I've been doing for a number of years in disaster zones, starting as far back as 2008 in Sichuan to Christchurch on multiple occasions, most recently in Christchurch after the terror attack, working with children um, there, um, uh, my, my colleague and friend said, do you think you could help teachers here in Australia? So I rang my friend Carol and I rang a number of other friends and within two weeks we were working in Sydney with teachers and we created a, um, a program called the Banksia Initiative. And the Banksia Initiative was about the idea that when schools reopened after the long summer holiday in Australia, teachers needed to deal with the anxiety, the worries and the fears of children who must have imagined that they were living at the end of time. The sky, literally dark in the middle of the day. You know, those children in Melbourne who were on holiday waiting on the beaches as the fires crashed towards them. And that school would go back. And what would school do? What would teachers do? And I remember meeting um, in Sydney with academics and artists and a whole range of people thinking about what that would mean. I remember sitting with about 40 teachers at the Sydney Theatre Company and we were going to do some work but the first hour and a half they sat and cried, and talked about their fears, their anxieties and their incredible anger with their government over the response to, to the fires. 
And I realised that the theatre has always played the role as the forum, the place where you gather to talk about the things that mattered. So I brought them into that space, was ready to launch into some theatre work with them, but we sat and we talked because the possibilities of communal dialogue are so small for us in the kind of fractured worlds in which we lived. But Carol and I, um, really good friends from all across Australia, um, worked together to pull together a really small resource, an online resource called the Banksia Initiative. It's called that because the Banksia flower, for it to flower, the seed needs the heat of the fires to burst. And the Banksia is the most gloriously beautiful, joyful plant that blossoms almost immediately after the fire. And what I was interested in was the notion of the Banksia, the notion of the arts in terms of the return to schools, so that in the darkness and the ugliness of the fire zones, beauty might be recreated in classrooms, and that would be the way back. Little did we know that by March, we would be dealing with a different crisis. You know, at one point in, in my life, we used to talk about, I think we, only as far ago as last year, we used to talk about once in a hundred year events. Now, of course, we, those once in a hundred year events in terms of the, the, the climate crises, all the crises that seem to be uh, uh, hitting us as a planet, are frequent. And as we went into lockdown four, my thought again went to the children, to the young people, especially the very young ones, in terms of how they would deal with weeks of isolation and understanding that at some point schools would go back. Carol and I worked in Christchurch immediately after the earthquake. And Carol was living there. I went down. I remember so clearly that they said that when schools reopened in Christchurch, and they did 10 days after the, the February earthquake, that Christchurch would go back to normal. Because it didn't. hasn't. And we haven't yet gone back to normal in this country, and it will take forever for us to go to a different post-normal world. So... Again, I rang my good friend Carol Much and said, I think we need to do something to help teachers when eventually kids go back. Um, and so we pulled together um, a resource called Tirito Toy. And um, I then rang people all over the country and all over the world. I got in touch with UNESCO and said I could do with some money. Um, and, you know, the lovely thing about UNESCO, they do great things, but they support really good projects. So I wanted to mihi to uh, UNESCO for um, the generosity of giving us some money so that we could get the thing up and running. Uh, it's really important, and perhaps even more important was to carry that name on the project with us. So I'm um, deeply grateful for that and having us here today. And then I rang my good friend here, Priya Gain, and said, you know, we really want to make sure that when we go back to schools and we're going back through the arts, that we have na toy. We have Māori arts there that teachers can use in schools. So Priya pulled together a team, a Rauri Hindal, a Makaira War, and they created Ha Ora. And Ha Ora has Waiata, has Haka has these most incredibly beautiful Māori ways of understanding our relationship to the earth, to the disasters, to ourselves. And they pulled together that, uh, this glorious part of Te Rito Toi, Ha Ora, in three weeks. Four weeks, I think, it wasn't it? Including videos of, of working, just absolutely glorious. There's two things about Ha Ora that I really wanted to share with you. Um, it is the first resources in Nga Toi for New Zealand schools in over a generation. So we may say that Nga Toi, that Māori arts define who we are as a country, but the most neglected, abandoned part of our curriculum in this country are Māori arts. 
So, Namihi Nui Akwe Te Rangatira Te Mana Wahini for your work and that gift to New Zealand teachers and New Zealand students so that when they went back, they went back through the Māori arts. We've just found some money to translate, written by Māori, uh, now translated into Māori, um, so that it's the first resources in Ngā Toi for Kura Kopapa Māori since 2002. Extraordinary, isn't it? So sometimes, like the Banksia plant, beautiful, glorious things arrive out of the darkness. Um, we created all sorts of wonderful drama, dance, music, ways back into schools. We launched Torito Toy on April 23, just as we were coming out of lockdown four into lockdown three. Within the first hour, it had been viewed over 20,000 times by teachers in New Zealand. Within two months, over a quarter of a million downloads. We ran webinars with over 30,000 teachers. It's been used in 114 different countries. It's about, a version of it is about to be created in Hong Kong, Taiwan and mainland China. We're working with indigenous artists in the southwest of the United States, up through into Calgary. We have some interest in Colombia and also in a number of Caribbean nations who are again looking at the possibility of the arts as a way to return to schools. A number of reasons, I think, why that's the case. Here in New Zealand, teachers grabbed at these resources because we've systematically killed the arts in New Zealand schools. And we've done that through deliberate government policy. So to have the arts as the gift that they are for young people to explore the world with, to express their deep feelings, to, to build connections with others, was grabbed at by teachers in a way that I never imagined. Who would have guessed an edu... Like, you can get 300,000 downloads on uh, Facebook if it's about a cat that's doing something funny. <laughs> but to get that amount of traffic on an education resource is quite extraordinary, <laughs> isn't it? And it speaks to me of the importance that teachers understand that a way back, a way to re-engage young people is through the power and the beauty of the arts. Te Toy, as a name, was gifted to us by our kaumatua at the University of Auckland, uh, Michael Stedman, um, or uh, Ngāti Whātua, or Ōrake. And when I talked to, to, to um, Michael about what we were planning to do and said, um, is there a name that we could have? Um, because we had this glorious metaphor in Australia. And he came back and he said, Te Rito Toy. And um, no one's ever asked what it means, because it doesn't translate exactly into anything in particular. But when I think about what it is, it speaks, I think, to the notion of global citizenship. The Rito is the tiny seedling part that sits at the heart of the harakeki plant. We all know what, it, what that part of the plant is. And Te Toy talks then about the importance of the seedling. And the seedling is kept safe by the leaves that surround it. That's how you protect the seedling. Te Toy, it's the arts that keep the seedling alive. It's the arts that nourish the plant. It's the arts which provide the nutrients for the growth of the plant. Torito Toy, what a beautiful, wonderful gift that my colleagues like Prayer, Carol, um, all across New Zealand and Australia have given to the world with the idea that Paulo Freire had. It's really, really simple that the purpose of schools is far bigger than getting something to get a job. <laughs> that the purpose of the arts are making humans more fully human. Thank you again for your inspiration and reminding me of that. Nō reira, tēnā tātou katoa.
Thank you, Peter. Wrapped up beautifully. Um, and I, th I think uh, that we've had a few metaphors tonight, but I think that metaphor there in terms of of Tirito Toy, the little seedling inside the flax plant, it goes with the, the thing about we are the project, doesn't it? If we don't nurture that little seedling, then we don't have a plant, we don't have an ecosystem, we don't have a planet. So I, I really like that particular metaphor. Um, and as you've heard, I, I did have a little bit to, to do on this um, project, but I just want to tell you one tiny little story. Um, I, I wrote some picture books about bears, um, at, well, a bear in particular who found himself in lockdown and um, you know had to find out about bubbles and social distancing and so on. The idea being that children in schools could, of course, relate to the bear. They could tell the bear how they were feeling or they could say, we did this too, and so on. So that was after the first lockdown. And then when school, the Auckland schools had their lockdown, one teacher told me when they went back after after the Auckland only lockdown, the kids said, will Bear be here to help us? So uh, I just, the point is that all the resources in Tirito Toy had exactly that same spark. They connected with children and young people right across schools in New Zealand and, as you've heard, in the world. Well, actually, one of the bears is now in Spain, in schools in Spain, um, where they're using it after their lockdown. So these things have gone a, a long way. But um, I think the other important thing that Peter has raised is one that all these things connect together and global citizenship education is just one idea that connects them together. But it's also, he mentioned the generosity of UNESCO, hosting tonight, having funding, having awards, bringing in youth leaders and so on. So that was a nice way of a little bit of free advertising for us. So thank you very much for that as well. Well, what we'd like to do now is invite everybody up the front and then I'll give them one question each and then after that, it's open to you. So please come and grab a seat. So make sure your microphones are on. So Josh, I'm gonna start with you. And I'm going to ask you all the same question. It's 50 years in the future. Well, Peter, you may, won't be around then, but just imagine that you are. <laughs> just about make it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what do you think will be the most important thing that we could have done to be in a really good place in our world in 50 years' time? What's the most important thing that we could have done? I think the most important thing would be starting that relationship, our global relationship with one each other. Um, being able to communicate, that would be the most important thing that I would see in 50 years. Great, thank you. So um, I think one of the most important things would probably be um, not just the communication with everyone else in our planet, but also especially the communication and our connection with the earth, um, with our climate and really getting in touch with it and, um, you know, sorting it out. That's a really hard question, Carol. Um, the place my mind goes is, oh, it's a bit like idealistic perhaps, but still, like the transformation of our economic system from being one that sees profit as progress to one that really puts the flourishing of people and environment at the core. Thank you. Um, Neil Gaiman, I don't know if you know him, he's oh, yeah. quite a stunning writer, isn't he? Mm. Um, Neil mm. Gaiman talks... It's the age thing, you know, the old funny... <laughs> it's what I can't see in the... <laughs> Oh, we got it now. Neil Gaiman describes um, the, the times that we live in this way. He says, um, there's no word in the English language for the pause between drawing in breath and drawing out. And that 2020 is like that pause moment between breaths. And it's been a long extended pause that the world is in that, that moment caught between. I spoke to so many people during the lockdown periods and, and, and since, and it was things like this that people said, 
I don't want to bounce back to where we were. That what we were before is not not the place I want to to go to. So 2020 could be the pause moment where we choose not to go back, but to leap forward. And for those of us in the arts, we might even skip and dance and paint and do it with others as we go into some imagined something else. So maybe the most important thing that we do in 2020 is take advantage of the pause, take advantage of the moment between breaths. Well, now I'm going to throw it open to you. So um, we've got Gracielli over here and Yuki on the other side. So, Oh, we've got more helpers. Great. We've got three of them spread around. So we're first hand up the back. Thank you. Kia ora tato. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your beautiful uh, presentations. Really enjoyed them. Uh, just got a bit of a theoretical question to start you off. Um, and it's one around terminology, and it's something I've, I've spent a little while thinking about. The language of education for sustainable development or global citizenship education, it, it implies that it's this new thing, it's this newfangled sort of very modern thing that, um, uh, that has evolved from what used to be a very transmissive form of education, as, um, as the boys from St. John's College rightly noted. Um, and in, in that sense, it's, it is a good thing because it, it makes – it's kind of a buzzword, right? It makes people feel like um, we've, we've gone somewhere with the development of our education system itself. But at the same time, I find it a very alienating – uh, terminology um, and when I think of global citizenship education or education for sustainable development, you sort of talk to Indigenous people in New Zealand and they say, well, that's just te ao Māori. That's just how we did things for, for hundreds of years. Um, and, uh, and I think Peter mentioned um, haora and, and just being fully human as different ways of thinking about it. Um, and the boys just now, they, they also said something along the lines of communicating will be a really important piece of the puzzle and how we move forward in 50 years' time. So how do we communicate this good work that's happening in the GCED sort of space without alienating people who, you know, who may feel um, like it's just another way that, you know, Western um, coloniser culture comes comes around and... and um, makes it sound like they've created this totally new, fantastic thing that's that's actually just the thing they should have been doing all along and um, other cultures and societies have been doing all along. So just wonder if um, Shruti and Peter would have any thoughts on that. <laughs> Kia ora, <laughs> great question. Your way. <laughs> it's a wonderful question. Um, yeah, I guess I have a couple of thoughts that arise. I guess one is around the phrase and then secondly everything that happens around the phrase. And I think, I mean, obviously both are important, but I think what's most important is how we deliver education or even education I find problematic learning. I find a bit more open education I often think of as school education is how my mind's conditioned to understanding it, whereas really the essence of what UNESCO is talking about is lifelong learning and this constant I'm the project, how do I keep growing and evolving and, and um, contributing? So I think in terms of how that's done, I think that's really up to us here in New Zealand to do that in partnership with Māori, in partnership with communities from all backgrounds, with the people that we wish to serve, be it the earth, be it the, you know, the people at the edges. And I think the way in which it's done is really, really like core and I think that will speak for itself. So I think that's where I'd almost put the emphasis. In terms of the, the phrase itself and to kind of more directly address your question, I mean, one thing is language, I think, with all language has lots of connotations and it needs to be a conversation. Like, I think if we give people a phrase, we all have our own labels and I think opening up conversations, that's where this space is so precious because we can have dialogue and there's room to go beyond. The world's become a space of, you know, 20-second sound bites. You know, our attention spans have become so small. You know, politicians responding to questions and debates about complex issues and with one line, it's like, it doesn't work. So I think making space to have real conversation in Kōrero about these issues will allow us to really yeah, address and acknowledge that this has been the way things have been in New Zealand and in many First Nations and other cultures for a very, very long time. So that space for conversation, I think, is key in staying away from short sound bites where we can. 
And just to add, that was the topic of our um, evening last year. <laughs> so, yeah, we've been there. I can share you some, some papers with you. <laughs> um, schools are a, a, a reasonably recent... Exp oh, I think we get it. No, I do it. Schools are a reasonably recent invention, aren't they? You know, experiment. And, 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 and we created them at the same time we created factories. You know, and so the compartmentalizing, the constant measurement, the, you know, the, the ways in which they, they operate to dehumanize are built on those kinds of factory models. And lots have shifted and changed, but the basic structure remains the same. So, you know, for me, I, I, I kind of struggle at those kinds of global citizenship education. For me, um, it is about how you... So John Dewey, over 100 years ago, was talking about um, the idea that you made democracy with your hands. And that what that about to me was that you saw yourself not just as a consumer, but you saw yourself as a maker, a producer. And that it was a flick in the way in which you saw yourself that much of what happens in life, you're reduced to being a spectator. And it's about how you can see yourself as an actor on, with and for the world that seems to me to be the important thing. You know, so much of what happens in the world reduces our capacity to be active, makes us passive receivers. So how you shift that around and say, I don't want to be the spectator to this, to the destruction of, of, of the planet, I actually want to be part of something. And if that's what global citizenship education is about, it's about making actors, it's about making producers rather than consumers. I'm 100% for it and I'll call it whatever it needs to be. There's a political urgency for schools to transform because they aren't built or fit for purpose for just about everybody, especially and including teachers, the more and more I talk to them. Thank you, and I think that's the point that the um, that uh, Josh and, and uh, Fred both raised in their talk, didn't they, about uh, transformative teaching rather than the, the very transmissive teaching that you've just mentioned. Okay, time for another question. Right, thank you, up the back there. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, and uh, thank you all for, for your whakaro and your kōrero, uh, it's been super interesting. Um, I wanted to ask if any of you had any thoughts around balance and, and sort of two examples I'm thinking of is around one around, um, you know, optimism and, and the idea of positivity um, and being, you know, like life is great, it's fantastic, but that can also be a little bit dismissive at times towards for people for whom life is not all that great. And how do we kind of have that optimism without ignoring some of the, the realities Um or in the same vein, how do we um, have that self-awareness and introspection without being stuck in that loop and not actually addressing the urgent practical, um, the, the urgent problems that are out there in a, in a practical way? Because um, you know either extreme can be can be disastrous in many ways. You know, rushing into things without properly considering it, while at the same time just sitting back, spending too much time just thinking about things without doing anything. Um, and so how do you find, or, or what are your thoughts on, on finding balance um, in, in sort of situations like that? So I'll start to see if either Fred or Josh, have you got an answer to that? How do you find balance between rushing in or taking your time? So I, I, I think um, that kind of relates back to the whole um, core, not issue, but um, perspective on communication, where I think we need to begin teaching our youth um, deep, or not deep, but real conversation um, and with that conversation, um, you can kind of like, you can kind of find the balance and, you know, um, talk to your peers about it and, uh, real, you could, you could, you'd be able to find the balance if, if we teach our youth how to really be honest and be, um, you know, aware of things that are going on, um, in our world. Well, I'll be speaking from a personal note. My balance is a little different. I am overly optimistic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yes, there is the problem of overseeing uh, issues, you know, being too happy. But then, 
<laughs> sorry, it's a little hard to articulate. Um, by being overly optimistic, you can see those issues and be like, you can change it, you can, f you can fix them. And that's the way I find balance is seeing those issues but staying optimistic, staying in that open mindset and where you can finish whatever problem that comes your way. We do have a phrase for that. It's called critical hope. Yeah, I think also relating to like the special program, uh, the special projects and the um, social enterprise thing. I think um, the we find the balance by taking on these real issues and trying to actually solve them as as young people and like really tackling the issues. So like obviously um, the the policy lighthouse and the drug court. You know we we know these problems are there. And we're optimistic that we can fix them. So I think it's just the balance between um, trying to fix the trying to fix these problems and these these real problems, and still being aware that they're there. Um, I think there's a difference between hope and optimism. The older I get, the less optimistic I am, but definitely definitely not less hopeful. Optimism seems to me to often end in disappointment. Hope is a way of being in the world. It's a way of responding. Um, the trick, I think, as you get older, is to keep the hope alive. And that there's probably nothing more important as you age than to retain a sense of hope. And often it's despite, not because because life teaches you that things don't always work out, that fairness is a great concept but it's not real, that you can spend your life fighting for social justice and you feel like you've got nowhere. In fact, you may, may be in a world where it's gone backwards, but the hope, um, Paulo Freire says critical hope is as important as clean water is to a fish. Hope is part of what keeps you alive. To pick up um, on your question about balancing introspection and action, which is a lovely one, I'd love to build on your breathing metaphor a little bit. So I, what I've noticed in my own life and in my work and in that of many around me, kind of life has these phases of inhales and exhales. An inhale is kind of a pause, reflect, retreat, be the lockdown period's been an amazing inhale for many of us. And then there are these exhales where I'm out in the world engaging and doing. The reality is every week is a mixture of the two. A day could be a mixture of the two. And certainly I've had exhale kind of years and inhale kind of years. And so I think it's not about necessarily, for me anyway, doing both, but honoring what does this moment call and need. And there'll be times in our life where I really need to be in and look after myself and need silence and thinking. And there are times where the energy is just pouring out and wants expression and, and work and, and allowing that. And the other metaphor that I find really beautiful, our Western world is just so linear, but in many of our Eastern indigenous cultures, there's a lot of focus on cycles. So the seasons is a beautiful cycle. Winter is really the period of introspection coming in, spring, you know, planting new ideas, summer, full expression, being really out and taking action, and autumn starting to come in again. And I'm finding aligning my life to the seasons allows this beautiful balance over the course of a year between kind of taking that action and taking that space, both of which I think go hand in hand. Thank you for that question. Now, I'm aware that we're kind of coming to close down and, and a time when we can go down and, and out and meet and everybody individually, but I don't want to close any discussion down if anyone has a burning question. Yes, thank you. It's on? Right, it's on. Yep, OK. I don't so much have a question as just a thought, a reflection that global citizenship education in New Zealand should also mean explaining or making sure that in the education system young people are made aware of the fact that we are so lucky in this country that we maybe take for granted our good fortune and that they need to learn about the situation, relatively less favourable situation of 
young people of their own age in other countries who don't have enough food um, and who have live in a degraded environment uh, with you know climate threats and sea level rise and things like that, we need to somehow build into our education our young people's consciousness that we need to increase our overseas aid. And we need to help those people with which New Zealand has a relationship. And perhaps also on a different uh, perspective, we need to learn their languages. We need to teach young people in this country other languages so that they can pick up other perspectives, of other ways of seeing the world through the languages of other people. Two things that we could work on more in the education system. Thank but you uh, that's not a question, but if you have time to <laughs> yep, th throw your thoughts back, that's fine. Okay. Anyone might wish to comment? Yeah, I think um, we, we had the project last year, the CARE project, um, which was it's going on the um, overseas aid, the, the medical steriliser, where um, they attempted to ship their product um, out to island nations that were in need. So I think um, it would be brilliant if more schools and um from from quite a young age people are our young people are taught you know that we have to help we have to help uh, not, like not just people in our country but people everywhere like we are all a community so we have to help everyone not just the people in our country um, agreed the one thing i would say is that in terms of language um Maranga Mai, 50 years ago, was demanding that Māori should be taught in New Zealand schools for 50 years. And there was two leaders of, national, of, of political parties who stood on the stage not far from here who said, we're not ready yet. Well, <laughs> I don't know if they're ready, but there's a hell of a lot of people in Aotearoa, New Zealand, who are ready for that. And telling us to keep waiting in schooling is not the answer to that. Um, so, yeah, you're absolutely right in terms of cultural understanding, in terms of identity. Let's start where we need to start first, which is Te Reo Māori here in Aotearoa. Just to build on that a little bit as well, I know as someone who's grown up in Auckland City, like my awareness of poverty in the regions and the rural parts of New Zealand is so minimal and it's every time I engage with it, I'm always kind of slapped in the face. Um, so I think how do we kind of have those conversations locally as well about poverty as well as globally? I think it's an and, it's not an either or. Um, and also when, we, when it comes to engaging our young people with global issues, how do we do it in a way that inspires responsibility and not guilt? And I've been a part of a number of groups that have gone to developing countries and volunteered and had kind of dismantling intense experiences and come back with a whole lot of guilt for one's privilege. And it's quite an emotional journey that one goes through. So completely agree with everything you're saying and I wonder how we can manage that process and take our young people on the emotional journeys and support them at that level as well as the sort of, yes, yeah, so it comes from a very healthy place. Right, I did see one last hand. Sorry that I'm going to have to... You may have to ask your question individually. We'll have one last question and then it's time for us all to gather to meet everybody individually. We have um, drinks and, and refreshments outside so that you can take your time. But we had uh, one question. Um, Talofa, I'm Leilani. I'm here from World Vision New Zealand. I just want to total call um, you just said because this is what I'm here for is global education about um, overseas. But I really want to um, ask similar, but especially to the boys, actually, um, in your classes and um, at school, how do you think overseas organisations like World Vision New, New Zealand can better come in and speak to our youth? Because um, I know you guys know what's happening in the world from Facebook, Instagram, everything, but how do we get you guys um, to take action? That's the question I have for global um, causes. Mm. One way, um, from our school, we don't really see um, outside work or um, world vision. We don't really see those type of organizations coming in. We usually have to do that research ourselves. Our, our school does encourage that uh, because of its school values, but in terms of actual engagement, we don't see that. And I feel like that if that we did see that, 
then we will definitely be encouraged. Um, we could see that uh, although we're not um, aligned with anything like World Vision, um, our own local communities uh, like uh, Policy Lighthouse, what, um, the projects that we do know that, uh, that we are a part of, we are very passionate about. So if we were, um, <laughs> if we were in communication with um, organizations, organizations like World Vision, we would become uh, passionate about that as well. Yeah, I think um, because of our special values as a college um, and we are encouraged to, you know, research these topics, I think in public school education, it would be a lot harder for people to become, like, more aware. So I think um, a way for you guys maybe to do that is obviously, like, have someone come in, like a liaison come in and, you know, speak to year groups or something like that. But, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much <laughs> all I can think of at the moment. So they've thrown you a whittle. You you need to take that that up. Okay, we have ten seconds each for one last thought, and then we'll call it to a close. We'll, we'll start at Peter. We'll start at your end this time. So that gives you time to think, Josh, about your amazing ten second bit sound bite. Peter, go. Oh. I'm really hopeful for Wednesday the 4th. I'm really hopeful that one day... I'm, I'm like the guy on Zoom, you know. Oh, I can't... I've got the microphone with it. You know that guy? It's me every time. Anyway, I'm really... I think I'm optimistic and hopeful about Tuesday the 4th of November in the United States. <laughs> yeah. Right, Shruti. Um... Oh man, 10 seconds is hard and I've already used five. Um, <laughs> it takes all of us and we've each got a part to play, no matter how small, no matter how simple it might seem, whether it's a purchasing choice or a hello to your neighbour, like every action counts and our cumulative efforts is what it's going to take to address these big issues. Kia ora. Um, we all do need to play a part um, and our youth are making a, a special effort to make a difference in our world and... Um, you've seen that through, our, through the presentations here. I'm excited, humbled and excited once again to see all the people that are working towards a better future. And a beautiful way to end. So a round of applause for everybody. <laughs>Thank you all so much. Uh, for those of you who can stay, please stay and enjoy. For those of you who have to go, may you travel safely back to where you need to go. And thank you for giving your time tonight and farewell to our virtual friends as well. So um, thank you to UNESCO as well for putting this on.